Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where tonight we're going to take a look at some STEAM summer camp ideas. I see that many of you are joining us for the first time, so we'd like to offer a special welcome if this is your first T-Cubed professional development webinar. We'd also like to thank everyone for completing the survey on the right side of your screen. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists tonight, Ann Schlemper and Eric Archer. Ann is certified to teach grades six or 12 and has a PhD in mathematics education. She was a 6 or 12 public school teacher for about six years, a TA at the University of Missouri for six years, and now she has been at Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri, teaching math and math education for 16 years. Anne has been a TQ regional instructor, instructor for 15 years, and currently her interests lie in the area of STEM and STEAM, although her love will always be fractions. She has two children, her daughter, Kaylee, named after the math mathematician, Sir Arthur Kaylee, is a freshman art major in college, and her son Isaac, named after Sir Isaac Newton, is a sophomore in high school and interested in engineering. And thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. And Eric is the Market Strategy Manager for the Worldwide Science and STEM Education Markets at Texas Instruments. He continues to lead the efforts for the development of content-based STEM programs, such as STEM Behind Hollywood and STEM Behind Health. Eric, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Ann or Eric using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate in the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. If that doesn't clear things up, in the participant window where your name is located, in the bottom left of that particular window, there's a little icon that looks like a phone. And if you continue to have audio issues, click that icon and it will give you call-in information. So instead of using the audio broadcast through your computer, you can call in using your phone. At this point, Anne is going to discuss our agenda. Okay, tonight we're going to um, talk a little bit about what is STEAM. Many of you have probably heard of STEM, but we'll talk a little bit about STEAM and why we think STEAM is important. We'll talk a little bit about our goals of STEAM camps, um, some things that we've tried, and where you can find some ideas yourself, um, how you can get your local community involved in your activities as you try these STEAM ideas out in your classrooms and in your camps, um, some ideas that both Eric and I have for the future. And then um, we'll send this back to Mike where he'll show you some online resources and um, hopefully give something away tonight. Thanks, Anne. And Eric is going to discuss our expected outcomes. Yeah, sure. Uh, so tonight what we're hoping to achieve is um, to, to explain some examples of how to teach students how to do graphic design using simple uh, TI basic programming skills. And, and many of you on the phone have probably used TI basic before, but a lot of you probably haven't. Uh, it's a real simple uh, language to, uh, to, to get up to speed on for coding. And by the way, I'm a biology guy, so I didn't do a whole lot of programming, and I can do it. I can do TI Basic, so it's, it's a great language, and Anne will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, also, we want to bring out the art by programming your handhelds interact with the TI Innovator Hub. Um, this is a new product uh, from TI, launched in the fall, 
and I'll talk more about what it is in a few minutes, but uh, essentially what it is is it's a device that lets students to, uh, use input and output control. And so I'll explain more about that later on. Um, we have a lot of great examples to show you tonight. And then uh, we're going to try to entice students with engineering by programming the handhelds to control things like stepper motors, uh, LEDs, speakers, uh, you name it, uh, pumps. There's all kinds of, of peripherals that you can use with uh, this whole system, this innovator plus the programming that's available on the handheld. So that's what we're trying to achieve tonight. Thanks so much, Eric. And it's all yours. Go ahead and share your desktop, please. Okay, so first let me begin, um, as I mentioned earlier, that um, the title of our webinar is STEAM Summer Camp Ideas, but um, really it doesn't have to be for summer camp. This could be before school, after school, it could be for a club, it could be an activity that you do in class. Um, it, these, some of these are very short activities, or you could put them together for a unit. You could collaborate with your science teachers, your art teachers, um, or you can just do them on, on your own. Um, uh, they're very doable uh, in, in a short period of time or as a big group of activities. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Even though this does say summer camp, it does not have to be in the summer. So we already kind of went through this goal for the um, the night, so I'm going to go through this. So to the next slide. So STEM, um, as we all know, uh, refers to science, technology, engineering, and math. So why the A? Um, my daughter actually drew this for my camp. This was our camp T-shirt, the STEM. Um, the art is very important. I sat down with um, some people who have done some research in this area, and they have found that, in particular, um, if you don't have a good perception of art, your creativity as you're trying to do things in science and technology, um, also your ability to see things in three dimensions and then draw them in two dimensions and vice versa is limited. They found that a lot of times the reason uh, we have fewer women in the areas of math and science is because they haven't had those um, experience in drawing things in 2D and then de developing them in 3D. So um, the more experiences they have with art as they are doing science and math um, is better. We used to try to keep these things separate, like if you're doing science and math, you're left-brained, and if you're doing art, you're right-brained. But we found that actually to be successful in the fields of science um, technology, engineering, mathematics, we really need to cross over those two sides of the brain. I have um, a video that I wanted to share with you, but I wasn't able to share that link with you tonight, but Mike, I believe, is sharing the link with you in the chat as we speak. Um, it's a really cute video. Um, it shares some research um, that has recently come out where they show people doing science and math and using both sides of their brain. Eric. Yeah, yeah the, uh, so, so um, on, on this particular, I, I, I didn't get a chance to, um, to try this out myself, but uh, uh, what I thought was interesting um, about this, uh, this particular area around the brain is that, uh, I, and I don't know if you know this, but uh, I remember going to graduate school listening to um, a discussion around uh, Albert Einstein and about uh, the corpus callosum, which is the part of the brain in between the two hemispheres, and how uh, Albert Einstein apparently had a, a larger cor corpus callosum. But basically, the corpus callosum is in charge of the, the communication between the two hemispheres in the brain. And Einstein, in addition to being a, an amazing mathematician and scientist, is also quite an accomplished uh, musician. And uh, so I, I, there, there's yeah, so your point, Ann, earlier, where you talked a little bit about the uh, the right brain, left brain stuff, and how really you need the whole brain to be successful. Um, I, you know, Einstein is apparently an example of that, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. 
Yeah, the video, uh, if you guys get a chance to watch it, kind of explains that a little bit more. So um, I, hope, I wish we had a chance to see it, but please check it out later. It's really um, a great video. Yeah, and I think we're going to try, Mike's going to try to send the link out uh, toward the end of the uh, webinar. So everybody should be able to get access to it. So why am I excited about STEAM? Well, um, I, I teach at the college level, and, and I find that, you know, students who come into the university or their college, they've already decided their, um, pretty much, what they're going to major in or it's going to be too late because if, if they're in high school, they take the minimum number of classes required to graduate, and if they come to college and say, oh, now I want to be a math major, they're not prepared to be a math major. They haven't taken enough math courses unless they've decided along the way in high school. So my personal reason for jumping in here was I thought we need to reach to them when they're in grades 3-8 before they get to high school and decide what classes they're going to take as they're um, choosing their high school courses um, or the, as they're choosing their science courses because again, you know, they only have to take so many to graduate, but you have opportunity to take so many more or to take programming courses or to take engineering courses. So my personal reason for getting involved in the STEAM field, STEAM area, was to get the kids excited about STEAM fields, let them know about what careers are available, and again, to encourage them to take beyond the minimum. Eric, do you want to say anything here? I, I do. Uh, so, so just to reiterate this, this idea that art is, is an important component in, uh, in, in just about everything you do, but specifically problem solving. Uh, you know, at TI, we I've been at TI now for 11 years, and it's been interesting uh, to see the combination of we have computer programmers, we have electrical engineers, we have mechanical engineers, uh, but we also have artists on staff, and um, they have fancy titles like industrial designer or or user experience uh, manager. Um, but, but essentially what they're trying to do is to incorporate uh, designs uh, into the software, into the handhelds. Um, we've done better on some handhelds than we have others. Uh, that you guys could argue about that. But the point is, is that they, they use design to try to um, enhance or improve the experience of interacting with a piece of technology. Uh, in order for them to do that, they have to understand a lot of the technology, the, how it works. and and uh, how it's going to be used and, and uh, what happens if the user does X, Y, or Z. Uh, they have to know all of those technical aspects to it before they can actually create the design itself. And so that industrial design field is a really important field. Uh, the company that does a good job with that is Apple. Uh, they've, they've made a, a sensational um, set of products because of the artists that are at Apple in addition to the engineers and the programmers and the problem solvers, um, the artists are right in that same ball, ballpark. They are problem solvers. And so I got excited when, when I was asked to be a part of this webinar, and um, Anne is, is, has been leading the way. She's done a sensational job. But uh, um, I'm seeing I see it in my office every day. I see these guys go out and, and, uh, and gals and, and solve problems um, using artistic ability. Uh, one more example, Anne, and I'll stop rambling on here. <laughs> Another example is the content that we've created. Those of you that have seen STEM Behind Hollywood, STEM Behind Health, STEM Behind Space and Mission Imagination and all these fun visual activities, um, mostly for Inspire, although we're starting to do more for the 84, um, the CE 84, is that uh, we have artists, graphic designers that help with those activities. They We have content writers, of course, but the actual graphic designers are the ones that are making the really amazing pictures and helping us with the simulations and um, and making a really pleasant experience for the students as they learn about whatever topic it may be in math and science. So um, it, it, this, the whole STEAM idea makes a lot of sense to me because I'm seeing it. I see it with my coworkers. Thank you, Eric. I'm done. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, he said he was a biologist. Well, I was a math major in the late 80s with a minor in computer science. So C was just coming out. So I learned to program in Fortran and Pascal 
and basic and, and a little assembly. So uh, I was a little rusty on programming, and so I was a little nervous about, you know, incorporating some programming into my STEAM camp. But uh, last spring, as, as being part of a T-cubed um, instructor, I, I got to see the innovator as it was coming out. It, it wasn't on the market yet. And um, I, I got so excited, I was like, I, I want to use this. And so I begged, I begged TI. I said, please, 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 let me have the innovator for my camp this summer. And it, it wasn't coming out into fall. Um, for, you know, sale, and so I, I, with a little begging and coaxing, they loaned it to me for um, the camp. So I'll show you some things we did, but before we used the Innovator, we just did some basic coding um, and some easy graphic design that anybody can do without the Innovator. So I just wanted to show you these things that we started with um, in my camp last summer. And again, these are grades three through eight kids. Um, you can do this with, I've done it with teachers, I've done it with kids that were older than that, but keep in mind these, uh, I use the 84s because that is the calculator that the district around me uses. Um, so you can do this also on, on the Inspire, of course. So anytime uh, you're lear learning a new program language, it doesn't matter if you're doing it on the computer or where you're doing it, um, one of the first programs you might want to write is considered the Hello World program because the, you write the program and you have immediate output to see if you've done it right. So this program is a very simple program. Um, I taught the students how to write a program so they need to find those menus on the calculator and output the word hello. Now they could, they didn't have to do hello and they didn't have to put it on that exact um, spot on the screen, so they learned about, you know, the number of rows and columns on the screen, um, and they could say anything they wanted as long as it wasn't bad. <laughs> um, and so they said little funny sayings, and they had a good time with that. Um, and so then uh, we moved on to a little bit fancier hello. Um, and I have a few of these things to show you on the um, 84, so let me just jump over here on the smart view. I don't know why it keeps shrinking up like this, but um, so if we go to the program, we wrote these um, uh, programs on here. They uh, wrote the first one, and so it wasn't. It didn't take them very long. Um, they wrote this one, and then they ran it. And we talked about what the different parts of the program would do, and so they were interested in. What would the pause do? I mean, that was a very important part. You know, it's going to output hello, but what is the pause doing? Well, it's spinning over here, and it's keeping the screen clean because you cleared the home. And so this was a very basic program for them to start off with. So then we hit enter, and it ends the program. Then we wrote this fancier hello. And they learned that the screen on the TI-84CE, anyway, if you're not using an 84CE, you can still do this. You just need to learn the size of your screen. Um, it has 10 rows and 26 columns. And so you have to put in the number of asterisks or whatever character you want to use. Um, and you have to put in the number of blanks. And so when you run this program here in a minute, this is what the output is, but the two pauses allows you to, let me find my fancy high here, have the border come out first, and then the hello. So they had a good time with that. And we did type this in the 84. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later that um, we didn't have access to the computer lab in the camp that I was in. And if you do have access to the computer lab, using TI Connect to type the program, which is where you see this screen capture, is actually a screen capture from TI Connect, um, is much easier than doing it on the 84 because when you see it on the 84, the program 
looks a little more difficult to type in. Um, and so it took a, took them a while, and I'll show you some of their comments. I have comments from the students about what they thought about typing this program in here. It, it wasn't like it was difficult, it was just a little time consuming. So from there, um, the students wanted to get a little more artistic, and so they knew the size of the screen. We took out grid paper, and they designed their own things. Now, I'm not artistic. My daughter will tell you that. She's the artist. And so I created this one just for tonight's um, webinar. So if you have a 10 by 26, I don't know if you guys can see my lovely artistic endeavor here. Um, I plotted it out, thought what I wanted it to look like, and um, I programmed it. And it came out like this. It's so beautiful. So proud of myself. <laughs> so I actually showed um, a guy in the airport who's not a mathematician. I said, can you tell what that says? And he said, steam. I said, well, then it's a success. I did it. <laughs> so they, a lot of them um, did shapes and designs, and there weren't words at all. Oh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> thanks, Pamela. Um, but uh, some, one girl did a completely black screen, like with her characters, and the actual design that she wanted was left white. So like she left out the characters. So it was really cool. Like they just got really excited. And so I know this is like baby graphic design, but we're talking about third and fourth graders. And they just had so much fun. They they kept, they kept saying, can we do another design? Can we do another design? And I was like, if only we were at a computer, this would be so much easier. It took a lot of time on the um, 84, but we can talk a little bit more about that later. So from here, uh, we did a few simple programs because, again, they were young ages. We just did sum and product and things like that, where they learned to take inputs, um, uh, do a calculation, and store the value and display the output. So here's an example program that we did. Now, the older kids, um, I did have eighth graders, and some of them, of course, were up in algebra, and so we did do the quadratic formula, and they were pretty excited. And so um, it's, again, a very simple program, so um, they were happy that we had done that. And so here's some of the comments from just doing simple coding on the 84. I'll let you take a little look. And this is their spelling, not mine. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah, my favorite's the bottom one. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So this part up here where it said he would have preferred learning it on the computer, I just want to mention that if you do have TI Connect and you open up TI Connect, you can have the kids do it, the programming on the new TI Connect CE, which is a free program that you can get off the TI website, and you can do your programming on here. So you can just start your new program, and their programming tools are over here. Like, for example, um, well, Clear Home is under control. Okay, I'm, I lied. Uh, there it is. It's under Input, Output, and you just copy it over there. You can also type these things. Um, but you have to make sure you get your um, type right. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, no, I was going to say, uh, so, so yeah, it's much easier with um, TI Connect CE. Like Ann said, it's a free download from our website. Just go to the TI website, and um, you'll find a link across the top that, uh, that, that um, offers software, and then you just go and find TI Connect CE, download it for free, uh, you don't need to register or anything like that. You literally just download it and use it. But um, what Ann's showing you on the side panel, the, where she's clicking the program menu and then control and input output. So if you don't have access to computers and, and your kids are going to have to use the TI-84, um, the, the good news is that they, they don't have to type all of those words. They have The, the TI-84 has the same kind of uh, objects available uh, as the the program that Ann's showing you right now. So uh, input, prompt, disp, 
display. All of that stuff, those are objects that the kids don't have to type. They just have to go to the program menu and uh, pick. They just choose them, and then they'll, they'll appear. Yeah, she's going to show you one of these right now. Um, so, you, yeah, you just name it, program, whatever you want. Um, it's a dirty program, man. No. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so you go to uh, you go to any of these these sub menus and and uh, you can pick whatever the uh, whatever the object is. So there is a little bit of typing the kids have to do depending on what what it is they're doing, but most of it's just um, go to the program menu, pick what you want, and then uh, it'll appear in the actual program itself. So it's pretty cool. It is it is more difficult on the handheld though. It takes a little getting used to, especially with younger younger kids. They caught on pretty fast. I mean, kids are faster than we are most of the time. You know how that is when it comes yes. to technology. So from there, um, we brought out the innovators, and um, you spoke a little bit about the innovators. Did you want to say anything else about them? Yeah, yeah. So okay. if you haven't seen or heard of the TI Innovator, I encourage you to go to the website and check it out. Um, and I'll try to describe what it is. It's basically a box. Uh, with a microcontroller inside of it, and what's a microcontroller? Well, it's just a um, it's a it's a computer chip, and and it's basically. Hang on, uh, I'm gonna get to the innovator. Oh, there perfect. It is. Okay. Oh yeah, that's it. Perfect. And so um, it's got a clear glass top on it, um, but if you look through the clear glass top, you'll see a bunch of circuits and uh, LEDs and all kinds of uh, complicated looking stuff. Uh, but basically, all of that stuff is is just a, a microcontroller uh, that is used, made by Big Ti. And for those of you that may not realize it or may not know, um, the calculator division at Ti we're we're among the smallest divisions at Ti. Most of what Ti does is making chips, making analog um, chips, semiconductors, uh, DLP. Uh, we, we make chips, and, and those chips are used in all kinds of products, uh, like uh, iPhones and tablets and computers, automobile computer systems. And so a lot of engineering companies like Apple, uh, they'll buy a board uh, from us, a microcontroller that tests a particular chip. In this case, the chip is called the MSP430. Uh, I don't know why they named it. An engineer must have named it. I don't know. But... Um, that's what it is. And so if you've heard of Arduino or, or if you've heard of Raspberry Pi, um, those are also microcontrollers. And so they give kids and adults uh, access to do things um, with inputs, like sensors, and then, and then respond to the data from those sensors in, in some kind of output, like a light flashing or a speaker uh, blaring or, or a motor turning. And so uh, the, the TI Innovator is somewhat unique in this space because um, unlike a lot of those other microcontrollers, uh, we've built in some protection uh, for this device. So it has several diodes that keep it from getting fried very easily. One of the downsides of using a microcontroller in a classroom is electrostatic discharge. <laughs> it's bad. And so it will fry the chip very quickly. And uh, so we've built in some, I'm not saying it's foolproof, but it, 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 it avoids that problem. And so we've tried to, Think about the classroom scenarios and build some plastic protection around it in addition to some electrostatic protection uh, to keep it from getting fried um, by kids walking around on carpet and, and not having some kind of discharge uh, mechanism. So, so that's what it is in, a, in kind of a nutshell, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have in the QA window. And then, Ann, I'm going to turn it back over to you to describe okay. what's going on here. And and the other thing is that you're programming this thing versus an Arduino versus a Raspberry Pi, you're programming it with the basic language and a calculator. You don't have to have a computer hooked up to your Raspberry Pi or your Arduino and programming in a very sophisticated language, um, which is okay if they've learned programming before, but these young kids were, had just learned this other programming that I had shown them, and they were ready to jump in and do these things that I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, I actually sent them this program. This is a program called Blink, and I had not taught them what a for loop was. I had not said anything. I just said, here's a program, run it. And they ran it, and I said, you tell me what this program does. And so the little light on the, um, you can see it right there on this slide, 
they figured out that it blinked 20 times and how long it was staying on and how long it was staying off. And so then they went in and edited an already program that I'd given them and they would change how many times it blinked and how long it would stay on and off. So um, I, I told my friend Mark Garneau, who, who, who's, if you don't know him, he's very famous in the TI, T-cubed world. Um, he's like, it's okay that you did that because he said how I, he learned to program was taking other people's programs and making slight changes to them and um, figuring out what if I change this number, what does that do to that program? What if I change this number, what does that do to the program? And so these kids were like, that's so cool. I made it go faster. I made it blink longer. And so it was great. And, and we didn't have to know um, very much at all. So it was super. And so then we went on to do this program. And so then I got to talk about RGB and I'm so sorry, you're going to step in here, Eric, and I'm so sorry my father up in heaven, the chemistry professor, I always forget which one is additive and which one is subtractive because we have RGB for light and then we have pigment. Um, I know uh, that I should keep this in straight, but I can't seem to do it because I know when you put all the colors together for light, you get white, but when you put yes. all the colors together for pigment, you get black. But it seems to be reversed in my mind. <laughs> no, you have a, yeah, like no, no, you're you're fine. It's uh, yeah, uh, white light is is all of the colors, um, and so it's it's uh, uh, additive, and then uh, pigment, which would be paints and crayons and those kinds of things, um, all of the colors uh, absorb all of the light, and that's why it appears black, and that would be uh, um, um, subtractive, and so that uh, yeah, it's it's. It's it's a good science lesson. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and so um, there is a link in here if you do get this PowerPoint, which I think Mike is sharing with you. Um, I have it open. It's a really cool link where I really I slid down to this one, and we had the smart board open, and the kids would I'd say come pick your favorite color, um, and they would come pick. Of course, one of the girls picked pink. I don't know. And so they learned that you needed. Um, 255 red, 51 green, and 255 blue to get this particular shade of pink. Or somebody who liked green and they picked these numbers. And so they would then, um, when you ran the program, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing, ran the program, uh, it would allow you to change the color on the innovator, the color of the light, um, to that particular shade. And so that was kind of fun. And so they learned about pigment and light. Um, this one also dealt with the light on the innovator. It lets you fade from red to blue and I know now they have red, blue, green fade and I'll show you later where you can find all these um, programs because um, I did not write any of these. I'll just fess up. They were given to me and uh, we just used them. Um, and so this one allowed you to fade from red to blue, but again, I gave them these programs and they went to town on changing the things and editing them on uh, the wiles and they figured out the different parts of the program pretty quickly on their own um, just by running the program over and over again and making slight changes to the program. And they weren't afraid to break it. It was so exciting. And then the very last um, program we did had to do with music because there is a built-in speaker on the innovator and um, I'll just tell you that I am not musical um, but my children are uh, and so this was sent to me as well and this is the birthday song happy birthday to anyone out there who's here there's a good chance we might have somebody who has have a birthday today <laughs> um, but these are the frequencies I know this now and these are the notes because down here we divide by the tempo divided by the notes. So this is a quarter note, this is a quarter note, half note, this will end up being a whole note. So, but the kids actually, I just told them, I said, I have no idea what this program does, but it plays happy birthday. And so we went and we investigated all these things. It was so much fun together and they loved the fact that they knew more than me. It was so exciting. 
because of course there was musicians in the room at this steam camp. There was plenty of those kids that knew a lot more than I did about music, and so we had a good old time with this. Um, so this is why I hope to incorporate the light and the music um, next summer uh, with what I plan to do. So let me just show you what the kids thought of this, and then I'm going to let Eric take over because I feel like I've done most of the talking. You're doing a great job. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Not that I don't mind talking if any of you out there know me. Okay, so um, the campers, this is what they thought. So again, I had the prototypes and I didn't have any of the extra stuff that you can get with it now. And so this is all they knew is that it could do light and sound. Um, so they would love it if it could do more, and this is where Eric comes in. He's going to show you that it, it can do a lot more. And of course, I've seen it do a lot more now, and I can't wait to do more with it. <laughs> All right, so I, I like the, how, I like how you have the uh, you did the survey at the end of the camp uh, to get the the kids' thoughts. You know, just going back to the product design process at TI and, and most companies. Um, this is this is how it's done. You get feedback from uh, from from users uh, uh, on on what to change and what they don't like and what they did like, and then you try to you know use the the resources of the engineers and the programmers and the artists to to refine. And so that's the beauty of of Steam is that it is a iterative process of of changing and improving and um, you know, it's. I mean, you see that with cell phones all the time. They're always trying to make them better, and that's based on feedback. So, yeah, no, I, I really like it that you got the kids' feedback. A lot of times, it's it's pretty much, um, hey, camp's done. Uh, see you guys next year. <laughs> you know, so, so this is good. Yeah, yeah. If you want to jump to the next slide, in, I will. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a few projects that we've been playing around with in the office. Uh, this this one we're calling the pet protector car alarm. Uh, it, it came about from uh, actually my, one of my son's um, science fair project. We were trying to use an innovator system, and um, like I said, I'm a biology guy, so for me, programming is not a, a thing that I, I was prepared for. Um, but I went through the, the 10 minutes of code program, and then I went through the 10 minutes of code with innovator program, uh, and then I did exactly what um, – uh, one of the pan one of the uh, participants was putting in the, uh, the comment window. I think it was uh, uh, who was it? It was Mark von uh, Rosenberg talking about the secret of great programming: steal and edit. And and I think that's great advice. And so I did as I as I um, got more and more into this. Uh, I, I learned to do a little more programming by borrowing uh, programs from other folks. And so I made my son, eighth grader, go through the same process. <laughs> and so on a Saturday, I forced him to sit in front of the computer and go through 10 minutes of code. And he was very reluctant, wasn't real happy with me at first, but then um, I would kind of peek in on him and he was getting into it and, and uh, he, he was enjoying it. And so he stayed in. And let me just interrupt for a second. Um, sure. Eric, we're going to show them later where they can find this 10 minutes of code and stuff. So if some of the participants are wondering what we're talking about, we'll show okay. you where we can find what you're talking about. Yeah, totally free resource on the TI website. And for 10 minutes of code, you don't have to have the new calculators. You can use older 84s, um, and they'll work just fine. So anyway, anyway. Uh, Long story short, too late for that. But I, I uh, my son and I worked through a science fair project, and this is this is the result of it. So I've got a ten dollar car that you can get from Walmart or or best or uh, big lots, and uh, and we outfitted the car with different sensors and motors. Um, and I think this is a video. If you could uh, play that for me real quick, you can play it in this mode. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine too. And so, oh, bummer. It's over here on my other screen. <laughs> no, we can see it. It's, oh, you can? Oh, we, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, shoot. You're good. See. Okay, what did I do? There we go. There you go. Yeah. Um, this is warming up, I guess. But the uh, the whole is point it is it says it's playing video, but it's not showing up. So maybe you were right. Yeah, let's go back to the uh, other mode where we were before. 
I think that'll be fine. There, wait. Just the uh, the slide the slide sorter, not the slideshow. Uh, just the edit mode. Okay, hang on a second. Yeah, no problem. While you're doing that, um, the the car itself is uh, is not really the focus. It's outfitting the car with. Um, oh, there you go, Ann. So, Ann, move your mouse below the video. Oh, there you go. There it is, and then hit that little little. There you go. Perfect. Um, Sorry. No, you're that's perfect. And so, uh, what you're seeing is the innovator is hooked up to the calculator. Uh, there's a program running called I think it's called Pet Protector in this iteration of the project. And and uh, once, yeah, so so right now, yeah, perfect. So it's showing a temperature sensor inside the car, a temperature sensor outside the car. And when you warm up the temperature sensor inside the car to a certain threshold, um, interesting things happen. And the way this program's set up is that the LED lights, which are on the front of the car, act as the headlights. And then there's a little motor in the bottom of your screen. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but uh, once the temperature gets to a certain threshold inside that vehicle, the lights will start to flash, the horn will honk, uh, the motor, which is supposed to represent like the, uh, the windows rolling up and down, it will be engaged, so it'll roll the windows down. And then uh, the little pet inside the car uh, has a chance of survival if it gets too hot. And so uh, that's what this project was. It was meant as a, a way to say, Hey, automotive manufacturers, this is really simple technology. We're doing it with a calculator and some sensors here uh, and a basic microcontroller. This should be something that's come standard in, in, uh, in all vehicles. It's not just for pets. It's, you know, for, for kids that, that have been left in hot cars as well. Go to the next slide, and I'm going to see if I got some close-up pictures there. Oh, yeah, so there's the $10 car. It's 10 bucks at um, Big Lots. And then one more. I'm a former teacher, so I, I try to find cheap stuff and Big Lots is a is an awesome resource for science teachers. Um, just a heads up on that if you haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> and so uh, the front of the car has the LEDs. Those are hooked up into the innovator. The temperature sensor and just move your cursor right on the dashboard of the car. The temperature sensor is there. Uh, and then go to the bottom of the screen where it has the USB cable just below that. That, that little thing is a called a sweeper motor. It's kind of like a stepper motor. It works in the same way. Uh, and it rolls the window up and down. And, and uh, other parts here you can't see. There's also another sensor inside called a hall sensor, which picks up magnetic fields. And, that, and I'll show you why that's important in a second. Go to slide 20, uh, the next slide 26. Okay, so here's our little kitty cat. It's got a leash on it. Although it looks a little funny, it's, it was meant to be a leash. We're not trying to hurt the kitty in any way. Although we did glue magnets to its feet with hot glue, so that wasn't very nice. But the whole point of this was um, to say that, hey, on the collar of the animal or the leash, you could have a magnet, and that magnet could be sensed by the hall sensor inside the car. So then that way the car knows if there is a pet or if there isn't a pet. And so it's an, another way to show. You can also use a motion sensor or you could use a, um, a proximity sensor. Uh, 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 as well, but you have the car has to have some way of knowing that there's an animal or a human inside the car. Otherwise, you don't want your windows rolling down in the middle of the parking lot for no reason. That would not be good. All right, next slide. Okay, so the, the where's the art piece in all this? Um, you know that that's up to you uh, and your kids. But uh, we are piloting this particular project with a co with Coil Middle School, which is a middle school in, in uh, Garland, Texas just outside Dallas, and these students um, are not made to be here. They're not getting a grade uh, to do this. They're not getting any extra credit. They, they just show up, and it's a 10-week program that we do before school starts, um, and like I said, there's really no incentive other than, hey, we're going to show you how to code, and we're going to do some cool projects. So we have about 10 to 12 students, depending on the day, um, show up each morning, uh, and they work in groups of two or three. And they, uh, they, they, their challenge was to design the system. And they can design it however they want. Uh, and and what, what happened that was interesting is that they did that. They designed the system. They're testing the system. They're testing the code for the system. But what we didn't even think about, we meaning people at TI, was that um, the kids might want to decorate their car, of course. You know, in hindsight, it makes sense. 
Well, they did that on their own. They started decorating their cars, and everybody's got a different looking car, and that became an engaging piece to this whole process that, you know, quite frankly, we, we missed. And so we've learned from this pilot project that the art piece is really important to the students. The students want it to be theirs. They want to design it to make it make a statement, to, to kind of show off a little bit, um, uh, in addition to it just being really cool to do. And so uh, that's something we've learned from, uh, from this experience at Coyle uh, Middle School. Uh, next slide, Ann, please. Yeah, this is just uh, the kids working on their car. Students are adding, um, there are different color LED lights. And so you can use purple or you can use green or red or, or white. Um, so the students are messing around with that uh, in this picture. And then one more. Okay, oh, okay. So this is the, this is another project that's been done. This project isn't as sophisticated in terms of the equipment required. All you need is a handheld, an innovator, uh, a temperature sensor, which are super cheap, uh, and some pipe cleaners. And uh, those are those little bendy, furry things, look like caterpillars. Uh, and so what, what this was, this project was, okay, we all remember the old mood rings where it, it turns colors based on your body temperature. So the challenge here was to make a mood ring. Well, to do that, you have to have something that will sense temperature. Well, temperature sensor is perfect for that. And then the LED light on the innovator itself turns uh, any color you want. And Ann talked a little bit about that earlier. So the students have to, have to define what the temperature thresholds are and then what color will the LED change. And, and, um, and so there's a really strong input here, temperature, and then the output is student defined based on whatever the condition may be. And conditional thinking and conditional statements are a key part of programming uh, that I've learned. And so uh, that's what this project is. And if you jump to the next slide, I think we've got some great examples of kids. So this fellow here um, on his right hand, on his ring finger, he's got a pipe cleaner ring uh, with a temperature sensor. And then if you look at his innovator, you can see there's a light. It's a red light. So uh, most of the kids picked red for hot. Um, so this fellow is showing everybody that he's hot is what's going on. That's why he's got a goofy smile on his face. <laughs> and then uh, next slide. This young lady is taking a different approach. Instead of relying on, on the temperature from her hand, she's, she's blowing hot air on it from her, uh, from her mouth. And you can see the innovator light there is red as well. So uh, the kids are doing some fun stuff. Uh, they, they're using art as a way of um, showing input and output uh, in addition to learning how to code, uh, which is kind of cool. And then the last slide for me, I think, is this one. So this is a, just an example of a more sophisticated project. This one is not, we haven't released any of these projects on our website yet, but we do plan to uh, in the near future, just a heads up. This is called the solar tracker. And what it does is it will track the sun throughout the day uh, based on two light sensors that are offset on the sides of it. And Ann's pointing to those right now, and they have little black straws on them uh, to, to try to focus the light uh, into the actual um, light diode on the, on the chip, on, on the board. And so the, the solar panel will follow the sun using motors, and Ann points to that little blue uh, motor, yep, perfect, uh, right there. So that's a motor that will rotate in one direction, and then there's another motor just under the left side of the panel um, that will rotate it uh, up and down. Yeah, there it is. And so it will uh, orient itself to the brightest possible uh, light that's available. And, and uh, as a result of that, you get about 38% more energy out of your solar panel investment. Now, the art piece in here is the design of the uh, chassis that red 3D printed chassis. It took a long time for a, that design to come about and it took multiple iterations before we found one that worked well. And so that art piece is evident here where you're trying to use a SolidWorks or a CAD type program to make a design in 2D and then you don't really know what it's gonna, how it's gonna work until it comes out in 3D. And so Ann talked a little bit about 2D and 3D earlier uh, and this is a perfect example of that. So uh, art isn't just, you know, um, free form expression and painting pictures. Art is also um, used a lot in solving these kinds of problems. And so it's uh, that design piece is critical 
um, in, in order to get a system to work in, you know, in, like this uh, solar system. Uh, now, the thing that's coming out of the innovator, and by the way, the innovator is inside of the the, the red box on the bottom, and it's pointing to it there. And then there's a breadboard that comes out of it. Uh, it there's a breadboard connector on the innovator. So if you want to do more sophisticated projects and have more components, uh, the sky's the limit. You can do that. And so that's what you're seeing here. What I like about this example is it shows you the, the other extreme. So Ant started you off with some basic coding uh, graphics on a screen. And then here we have, you can take this thing as far as you want. And by the way, this is all programmed using a TI-84 plus CE uh, calculator. So cool stuff. All right, for time's sake, Ant, i got to turn it back over to you. Okay. So uh, just show you real quick where you can find all of these things. Of course, this is the site everyone should memorize. Make sure you do do education before the ti.com. And, oh, uh, shoot. Um, so this is the main website. But if you come to uh, activities, you can go to TI, sorry, TI codes. You hold that down. And I already opened this up. And you can do 84 or um, inspire. And I did the 84. And I kind of already showed you that you can go through these different skill builders, and I think this is what Eric was saying, that he had his son just go unit by unit, skill builder by skill builder. You can see in unit one, you have three skill builders, and you work your way through just um, using variables and conditionals and loops and then graphics. Um, and so this is something you can do, um, have students do by themselves, or you can have them do um, with uh, in class as a group. And then um, this here is where you can find more coding that's more science and STEM related. So let me just say something real quick. Um, I have these described here, but Eric said something about collecting data. I think you guys need to realize that you can get the community involved in helping you with your STEAM activities, not only getting funding, but uh, materials and donations, especially if you do collect some data so that you can show what your kids knew before you did this and after you did this. I know a lot of people don't like this whole idea of pre and post test stuff, but as a math educator, I know that showing the, even the parents what your kids learned before and after being involved in these STEAM fields, but also businesses and people who can donate to you to your um, activities. I had, um, sorry, I lost my slide. I had several companies, including 3M, donate to our camp. And a local business um, let us visit. And we got to do some really cool science, sciencey things um, at the lab. And they're going to help out next year as well. Uh, 3M is also considering contributing a larger amount this summer as I'm going to be doing a teacher academy as well as a student academy. So being able to show that my students learned something in our pilot camp last year is very beneficial. So please do ask your students what they learned and what they liked. It's, it, it really didn't take long at all for me to do that. Um, so some ideas that we have in the future, I think I mentioned already that I hope to use light and music and accompany it with some sculptures. So I'm bringing in some art professors and we're hoping to make it a little more maker space. Um, use cups, wires, plastic cups, um, all different um, mediums. Maybe some might hang from the ceiling, maybe some might be motorized, um, and then add light and music to accompany these sculptures. And then I'm going to let um, Eric talk about his future plans. And then I think we'll be wrapping it up. Yeah, so uh, there, there are a bunch of projects we can do uh, with, with this technology. Uh, one of the things we're trying out right now is having groups of students create a song, like Mary Had a Little Lamb, uh, using individual notes from their group. And so the first group plays the, the note A, and then the next group plays the note C, and so on. Well, in order to do that, they have to work together, which is, <laughs> which is can be frustrating watching that happen, uh, but it eventually it will happen. Uh, yeah, Try taking a bunch of eighth graders to an escape room. That's what I did recently, and that was fun watching. I had a 
you know, sit on my hands and keep my mouth quiet while they scattered all over the place. But uh, it's that same kind of idea. They will work it out. They will figure it out. Um, and at the end of that that process, they'll play Mary Had a Little Lamb on their handhelds using an innovator. It's really cool. Uh, another project you could have them do is build a smart house. And so they can design the actual house itself using cardboard or foam board and a bunch of art supplies like some of the ones that Ann mentioned. Uh, and then and then have them, uh, you know, uh, set up an air conditioning system inside the house uh, using temperature probes to let you know to to inform what if the AC turns on or off or the lights turn on if there's someone enters the room or a model enters the room. Uh, the the next one we are definitely working on is a zombie proximity alarm, and this one's going to be uh, around the whole zombie apocalypse theme and Walking Dead kind of thing. Uh, but it's going to be the students have to design the actual system to detect the presence of uh, zombies. And then what do you do about it? Uh, are you, you going to run? You know, um, is there a way to fight back the zombies? Is there a system you can create to shut the door or, or you know, zap them or something? Um, and so so it's pretty open-ended. It's going to be a lot of fun, and, and we're hoping to get something around that in July or August. All right. I think we need to turn it back over to the mic. Thanks so much. As we begin wrapping things up tonight, if you have any last minute questions uh, for Eric or Ann, please try to get those asked. Um, I know I just saw a question come in from Stephen and um, Eric, maybe you can talk to this more, but um, Stephen's wondering where do I find more information about the solar tracker? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, like I said, this is a sort of a work in progress, but I'm hoping we'll probably have some files for that on the website. Uh, in the fall is what I'm guessing. We've got a couple other projects we're working on right now, but um, another thing you could do, Stephen, is if um, you send me an email, I, I might be able to get you some things now. Um, my email address, uh, I'll just send it out to everybody. It's earcher at ti.com. I'll send that to everybody. And then uh, shoot me an email and remind me, and I'll, I'll see if there's anything we can send you today. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention uh, a couple things that are available on our website. Um, Anne already did a great job of showing where you can get some of these great resources and where um, whenever the resources are available, like Eric just mentioned. The, uh, Eric, I'm, I'm guessing they're probably going to be listed probably under the activities tab somewhere. Yeah, most likely. Either that or the, uh, the TI bulletin board, which is in that bottom left-hand corner of that site you're on right now. Got it. Yep. Well, I just want to mention uh, two things on our website. One is if you go down to webinars and tutorials under the professional development tab and slide down to live webinars. Uh, if you take a look next Tuesday, uh, we have another webinar that's focusing on STEM projects and also the TI Innovator Hub. We did some practice uh, with that tonight and it's looking to shape up pretty well. So um, if you're looking to get more information about STEM and specifically using the TI Innovator Hub, um, in your classroom. Next Tuesday is a great webinar uh, to join as well. Um, again, these are free, and if you are interested in next week's webinar but you can't attend, feel free to register and you'll automatically get a follow-up email uh, with a link that says, we're sorry you missed it, but here's a link to the recording so you can watch it at your own pace, at your own leisure. Also want to mention uh, recently um, we offer some T-Cubed Summer Professional Development Workshops and uh, registration went live for these. So um, I only mention this just because uh, if we look down, there's, there's a lot of workshops available across the United States. I believe there's over 50 this summer. Um, there's a bunch just quickly looking over that folks on STEM and the TI Innovator Hub, as well as learning to code. So uh, again, if this is something that you're interested in, please visit our website and take a look at some TQ summer workshops. Uh, there's a really good chance that there's probably one near you, and uh, we'd love to see you at a T-Cubed Summer Professional Development Workshop. Uh, last, uh, last thing I want to mention about the T-Cubed Summer Workshops, earlier Ann said uh, stick around because at the end we're going to be giving away to one lucky winner um, a complimentary registration for a T-Cubed Summer Workshop, and tonight's lucky winner is Jennifer Rowland. So Jennifer, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email 
in a couple of days to give you a little more information, but we really hope to see you at a T-Cube summer workshop. To receive a certificate, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is the link for the documents. So for instance, if you're interested in getting access to the PowerPoint that Ann and Eric used tonight, uh, it's listed under the documents tab. If either one of these links aren't working for you tonight for whatever reason, um, have no fear, you'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple days. And again, that follow-up email will have a link to the recording, a link to the certificate, and also a link to the documents. Thanks so much, Ann and Eric, for sharing everything you did tonight. Uh, I was uh, really excited to see some of the things that are happening in STEAM, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for hosting, Mike. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Ann. Thanks, Eric. Again, thanks so much, everyone. And we hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.